right? Like the backpropagation algorithm doesn't come from the network itself. It comes from software running outside the data structure of the artificial neural network. Whereas in the brain, the network has to be doing it to itself, right? So you need some kind of global view to be able to do this um, chain rule to push your sort of updates backward through the network to do the trickled back of the backpropagation. And the brains can't do that. Everything is sort of local and internal as opposed to global and external. So that's the first major issue. Hello and welcome back to the Bit of a Tangent podcast. For newcomers who are wondering what this is all about, I'm Gianluca, an AI grad student with a background in genetics. As always, I'll be joined by my brilliant co-host Jared, a reincarnation of Richard Feynman, but as a medical student with a penchant for machine learning. So what is this episode about? Well, typically when Jared and I sit down to record an episode, we have a sound check discussion before we get to the body of the discussion. This is one of those sound check discussions, but one that went way too far. Jared has recently been attending a graduate summer school program on computational neuroscience. I asked him how it's been going, and it spiraled into a 45-minute discussion about the EXOR problem, dendritic calculations, neural versus neuronal modeling, energy efficiency in brains and machines, heuristics and uncertainty, evidence integration and drift diffusion models, as well as the possibility of backpropagation in brains. Being a total off-the-cuff conversation, this was never intended to be a formal episode, and so we don't spend any time at all really explaining the fundamental concepts that we build up the conversation from. So this one might be a bit unfriendly for those of you who are not at least somewhat versed in neuroscience, some machine learning, or how biology and computation might work together. So if this isn't the episode for you, perhaps you'd want to check out one of our two prior episodes that we also recorded around the same time, where we discuss the 19 greatest ideas Jared encountered in 2019, as well as my six reading recommendations for your 2020. That said, We think some significant subset of our listeners would really enjoy this discussion, and so we thought, why not put it out there as an episode? It's pretty freeform, and we just throw around a bunch of ideas that we've been thinking about recently, so it definitely gets into the weeds of neuroscience and machine learning. As a disclaimer, neither of us are really experts here, so it's quite likely that someone listening to this podcast will know way more about some of these topics than we do, and it's also likely that some of you might have no idea what we're on about. But we do hold our listeners in very high esteem, and we think that these kinds of uncompromising dialogues are an important piece of what we offer at Bit of a Tangent. The attention economy means that many media outlets, uh, YouTube channels, podcasts, television shows, have to cater to the lowest common denominator out of necessity. But we're in the fortunate position that we don't have to do that. And these kinds of conversations are ones that can really extend the horizons of the people listening and Jared and I. We learned a lot through it. And if at least one of you does, then it's been something that's worth putting out into the world. The show notes for this week are pretty sparse, as we didn't want to clutter it up with trying to flag everything that we mentioned. There is a lot. And if you haven't heard about it, this stuff before, most of the time, a quick Google of the keywords will give you what you need. But you're also welcome to tweet to us and ask us questions, ask for clarification, point out where we might have gone wrong or where we may have, by sheer dumb luck, said something quite brilliant. The show notes do list links to our Twitter pages, as well as the Twitter page for a bit of a tangent and the Instagram page too. We are both pretty active on all of those platforms, and it's a great way for you to give us feedback without having to send out a whole email, as well as having the option to participate in polls about the topics for future discussions and various other fun anecdotes. That leaves little more to say. Thank you once again for your continued support, and please enjoy this episode of Bit of a Tangent. All right, cool. So you are at the moment um, doing a summer school program in what's a computational neuro? Yeah, computational neuroscience summer school program in Musenberg here in South Africa. And so it's in Musenberg. So it's affiliated with UCT, the University of Cape Town, but it's it's associated with the Ebro Simons Foundation, and some of the lecturers 
and the organizers are from the University of Cape Town. Right. And there's a bunch of external lecturers, and it's been really, really good so far. Awesome. Yeah. Um, a sort of intro to basically like neuronal dynamics and machine learning methods in neuroscience and basically how you model, read, record, and interpret um, neuronal simulations and then how you can use that data or rather learn from that data to um, make interesting claims about the systems you're studying. And it's been like a fairly in-depth, like it's it's been at two levels. There's the level where because the participants come from a lot of different backgrounds, I mean, we have sort of physicists or engineers or like pure mathematicians who have like never done biology in their lives. And then you've got people who actually do computational neuroscience as sort of like a master's or PhD level. And then you've got me in neither of those two camps. A professional dilettante. Um, exactly. Um, <laughs> You're the perfect candidate for this kind of thing, right? It sounds awesome though. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been really cool. So hmm. yeah, I mean, I think the, the two levels that it operates at is sometimes it's it's very like introductory. It's It's catching you up on like the basic differential equations that you use to model any neuron, right? But then sometimes it's like, okay, cool. In this lecture, we're going to look at the latest research published on dendritic computation. And I mean, this lecture was literally citing research that was published in 2020. So wow, it was it was published on like the 5th of January 2020. And it was in our lecture by the 7th of January or something like that. Um, Cheapers. Yeah. Where are they publishing this stuff? Because like, it sounds like they've got a pretty good turnaround time there. I mean, it sounds like I think it was, Mr. It was in science. It was a science paper. It wasn't the, it wasn't the okay. lecture's work, but you know, I mean, I think the, the field adapts or, or moves so quickly yeah. that it was an important new development. I mean, it was, it was, it was so cool. It, it's um, a group that sort of found a different spike morphology in neurons. And the reason this is really cool is because it gives you a sort of biological way to implement an XOR gate. Okay. And the really cool thing is that there's a way that you can like meta program your XOR gate to become an AND gate. It's it's really pretty. It's really interesting. Cause because XOR gate, um, if my memory serves correctly, is the logic gate that a um single like neuron, a perceptron uh, in the in the artificial sense can't actually model right well, so it's it's like the one exception case if i remember so that's like in the in the classic in, theory yeah, so that was that was the there was a book by marvin minsky right and that caused like the big ai winter because they have that whole book and then at the end of it they come out and well not in the end somewhere in the middle they say oh um the, the perceptron can't really model an XOR gate and apparently if i have the reading of the history correct this causes this loss of interest in perceptrons which of course spoiler alert mm. they're used all the time now but then apparently and i haven't read the book so take this with a grain of salt apparently towards the end of the book he sort of concedes that oh you probably could it's just like i don't know if he said like technologically it's infeasible and maybe like the sort of catch-up of gpu technology and compute has enabled it or but apparently there was some caveat where he actually in some sense acknowledged it could be done and then right. maybe eventually the theory came along so i mean from what i know of this it was it was more a case of like it was this critical flaw that sort of suggested that perceptrons might not be the way to go for intelligent systems. So just to you know bring people up to speed if they're not uh, familiar with with um, like Boolean logic gates. So essentially, your your ands, your ors, your nots, all those kind of things we're used to using them when we type queries into you know um, electronic search tools. Um, but they're the essential fundamentals that allow electrons to flow and we build our computers out of them um, and an XOR gate is a different kind of OR gate so in a normal OR gate you can have you know if A is true then the gate will open if B is true the gate will open if A and B are true the gate will open and an XOR is exactly the same except if both are true it doesn't open it's exclusive OR so it has to be one or the other but not both and the idea being with a single perceptron which is essentially like a model of a single neuron but in a very simplified sense you, would, you wouldn't be able to linearly separate um, space in such a way as to produce an XOR with like a single linear function. But if you just chain uh, two of them together, you can then do that. Oh, yes, this, this is so the solution, it's, you're right, yeah. So this is the solution. So the so solution was, was, was deep networks. The solution was just add more layers. Um, and and, and, and it's, it's almost funny that like that wasn't 
you know obvious to people but like back in back at the time it was like you know i I mean there are a lot of reasons why you should in theory be able to linearly separate just about anything and why they might have thought the things they thought and now you know you can code up a perceptron in like two lines of python if you know what you're doing and can run instantly but back in the day most of this was being worked out theoretically and you know you didn't have access to compute like we do now Mm. And I mean, make- but that's interesting. The yeah. idea that a biological neuron might be able to do the exor gate. So some of the abstractions that we apply when going from neurons in living biological systems to the artificial sort of uh, shadows of them, these very simplified models, is actually abstracting away some stuff that might be useful for actual problem solving. Well, I mean, so the, the key here is is like this implementation, and the reason this whole lecture was so interesting is because. It's happening at the level of the dendrite, and so if you think about that, what that mm. is right. I mean, you've got your an, uh, you've got a neuron, right, which has a cell body, and it's got this long axon, and that's what you typically think of as sending signals out of the cell. But the part where the neuron receives inputs, right, is made out of these little knobs. They look like, and they're called dendrites. And I mean, some cells are connected to something like ten thousand other neurons, right, and at the level of the dendrite, there's something going on computationally. And so this is actually one of the themes of this course has been, what are the limitations of perceptrons? And in what way, I mean, everyone has read some story by now in the Washington Post about biologically inspired neural networks, right? It's like, these are AI systems that mimic how the brain works to recognize images, right? And in some sense, right, the perceptron, you know, it, it mimics the idea of you can have inputs, and then if the inputs satisfy some threshold, right, then you get a, some output, and the, you chain a lot of those together, and that kind of looks like a brain. But what the people who are doing dendritic computation are doing is they're saying, no, 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 like internal to a single neuron, there is more going on, right? Like a perceptron is a bad model of a neuron. It's a terrible one, in fact, because... So it's the simplest possible model of a neuron, in fact, almost. Exactly, right? It's, 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 it's a, if you said the only compu- computation that a, a neuron does is some inputs and given output, that would be a perceptron. But if you think about it, right? I mean, biology is forced to work within very narrow constraints, right? And so if you mm. have this really complex intracellular architecture, right, made out of lots of compartments, thousands or tens of thousands of these connections, and ion channels and genes and little cellular organelles, you can do a lot of internal state computing that will affect maybe that output. In and of itself, the cell is not reducible to just the output, it seems. And like exploring that has been really, really interesting to me. And just one yeah. example that I saw when I was sort of reading on my own about the, the possibility of intracellular computation so obviously this dendritic computation is, is one path you can go down. But then a really fascinating one has been this kind of idea of metaprogramming, right? Because one thing that you can do in the brain is, is shift the architecture around, right? In, in a normal computer like you might use, your hardware itself is fixed and you put different software abstractions out of that same hardware. But this would be like the ability to change the wiring inside your computer. And there's a way that some cells have been shown to do this uh, they've shown it in, I want to say, uh, um, fly neurons, where they yeah. actually, there's a viral gene that's integrated into the DNA of the fly. Um, but it was integrated, you know, millions or billions of years ago. And what it does, it, in, it encodes for a little viral capsid, right, the covering of the virus. Mm. And it seems to be able to contain RNA, right? Uh, so the the units of the cell that would contain the instructions to synthesize a protein. And then, if I remember correctly, they observed, a lab observed neurons passing these like packets of RNA between themselves. And if you think about it, that's like an extra layer of, of, of signaling mm-hmm. because now you're, sa- you're basically sending direct instructions. Like, for example, you could send the RNA for the encoding of a particular kind of ion channel. And of course, ion channels on the receiving cell are how messages are passed in the brain. They're they're little holes in the cell that when open, they let charge flow into the cell. And that charge flowing into the cell is how the cell then sets up the ability to spike, right? And send the signal that neurons are famous for. Mm. 
And so if you think about this, this is like another level of programming. This is saying, I'm going to change the density of receptor by telling this other cell how to do that. And so, I mean, yeah. I think this is all very tentative and new, but I yeah. browsed across it. I mean, this is fascinating. The things that are suggested by this just boggle the mind, right? I mean, you're getting into almost like ASICs here, like the, those chips that uh, the electric engineers go wild about, where you can you, you almost program the, the hardware structure and then the, you, the result that you get out is these almost custom-designed, purpose-built, high-performance pieces of hardware, which I suppose is, is what's happening a lot of the time in the brain. But now you're saying it's, it's so flexible and um, able to adapt in sort of some, something approaching real-time. It, yeah, it just it, it, boggles, it boggles the mind to, to think about this. A, a few points on everything you've said there, because um, now my brain is just exploding with ideas. So the first one is, it sounds like a lot of what this... Um, the summer program is focusing on is neuronal modeling as opposed to neural modeling. Um, and I think there's like, I mean, I've never really juxtaposed the terms deliberately before, but it seems to me that there's like a interesting difference in domain there. Like the neuronal side is looking very much at, okay, how do you best simulate what's actually happening in these biological neurons? And how do those like individual elements, uh, like how do the properties of those individual elements really shape what sort of, in air quotes, emerges when you connect them all together? Whereas with neural modeling, you're looking at more sort of how does the structure of chaining the things together produce certain properties? And it's, it's, it's fascinating that there can be so much difference in sort of the tools that are applied to both of those areas and the sort of results that you find or interesting observations that one can make. Um, and I think that's an interesting sort of juxtaposition to look at because you can do a lot of the neural modeling with perceptrons with these very basic simplest approximations of biological neurons and still get very similar results to what you see in the brain like you can create a convolutional neural network that almost directly maps to and predicts how actual humans will respond to certain vision tasks but those are obviously built up from these super simplified oversimplified neuronal models right whereas the neuronal side you, you you're really getting all this extra magic that comes along for the ride with biology and that's like the second idea here of of things being biologically inspired like we think a lot of the time about biologically inspired design and it's brilliant in many ways but the great example of this is um like powered flight right like when when, when wright brothers and uh, all their their peer group were trying to develop uh flight you know for for, for hundreds of years humans have just try to straight up copy birds and the trick was to copy birds, but up to a point. And at some point, it actually was better to not copy birds in the sense of don't flap, don't flap, like copy the wings. Yeah, you're on the right track there. Flapping, not so much, you know, actually just pull yourself through the air really quickly using a, a rotating joint that no, nothing in nature has, you know, propeller, good job, good idea. So it's this idea of like how tight or loose is your analogy to nature and, and where do you draw the line, right? Like is our goal to perfectly simulate nature? And that is sure, that is one goal. But you don't necessarily have to perfectly recreate something. In fact, you might not want to. That might be the path to failure. And so there's this interesting sort of trade-off of like how closely do we want to model something to nature when we're taking inspiration? Um, and, and it's an unsolved question, right? And that's why there's so many interesting things to explore here. It's like how, how faithful do you want to be to the original biological structure? Because the, the trade-off that comes along for the ride there is like with things that are human-designed, they can be very modular. Like that's the beauty. That's why we oversimplify our neural, um, sorry, our neuronal models, why perceptrons are so simple is because then we can do things with them rapidly. We can iterate and change our design. If you look at the developments that have happened in the last 10 years with deep learning, I mean, that's the reason we're able to do so many of those things is because you can look at it as a whole and make big decisions and changes. And you've got these simple, well-defined units that are easy to move around. But in nature, that doesn't happen. Evolution can't to sit down one day and refactor the whole code base it has to do things in little increments right it's like it has to it can only move to sort of an adjacent state at a time and everything else has to still remain consistent so you can't make big overall structural changes and this is where things like this uh, rna in the capsid almost hack like it seems like a, a, hack, like a, a lazy before. developer's hack right and and that's and that's the thing is like nature is full of those kind of cases and and maybe that is a bug and maybe that's a feature and we don't know and that's why exploring it is so so fascinating so i mean the interesting piece of that analogy right between the difference between powered human flight and and bird flight it it gets at something which is key i think in our 
continued attempts as a society to understand the brain. Because the one thing that deep neural nets are terrible at is, is energy efficiency, right? I mean, you're throwing, first of all, sometimes millions of training examples at these networks and the computational equivalent of several human years and the amount of time and energy is you know enough to power like maybe a small home, right? And if you think about the analogy back to flight, or let, actually, let me just say, it, compare that to the brain, right? Where you get often one shot learning from very few examples and at the energy efficiency of about 20 watts, I think what it takes to run a brain. Now, and if you think about how powerful in general our intelligence is, we're implementing whatever it is that our intelligence is, it's being implemented with 20 watts in like a few kilograms of, of tissue between our ears. And if you look at flight, right, birds evolved this wing structure and hollow bones and a very specific musculature. But humans to do powered flight, we needed a rigid wing and we needed a way to just get more uh, power output. And if you think about it, it sort of points to the fact that the constraint for biology under evolution is always fitness payoffs. And one thing that you pay for quite dearly is, is excess energy consumption. And so it makes sense that our brain, for whatever it can do, does it at the minimal en energetic cost. And the same for flight, right? The reason that you don't see propellers is because once you need a propeller, it's the, t the kind of flight you're, you're playing with is not constrained by energy as its main factor, right? Whereas with humans, right, the, the story of the 18th and 19th, 19th century, right, is, is unlocking greater and greater fuel sources or, or rather more dense fuel sources. And so at some point, right. we have the ability to harness enough energy that energy no longer becomes the binding factor or the bottleneck. And we explore these new architectures. And I think that's kind of where we're at with deep learning today is we're sort of not constraining ourselves by energy considerations. But I do think that over the longer term, in the same way that now there's more focus and more demand, I think, by consumers that their cars, for example, become more efficient, right? I mean, no one, I mean, no one is, is driving sort of 1970s style muscle cars, you know? I think the same kind of thing has to happen in, in deep learning. This is happening already. And yeah, it's, 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 it's going to be fascinating to see. I think a lot of people are saying, hey, are we having another AI winter? Because it seems like there was this period of rapid uh, progress and um, advancement. And now it's kind of, you know, now it's just trickling out into all layers of, of industry. Um, but yeah, a, a nice analogy for, for those who are otherwise inclined would be to say, you know, like back in the early 2000s, the, the top race cars were like only now have we just managed to outperform them in terms of just, you know, speed around the track. But we can do the same thing that they could do in the early 2000s now with vehicles that use like some you know like a percentage of the the fuel and energy consumption you know they regenerate energy we can now do it with fully electric vehicles you know we can do it in all these sustainable ways from like recycled materials and from components that can last you know for 10 years um when when the others used to last for one race and so it, it's 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 this question of you unlock performance and then you make it really optimal and efficient and then you unlock more performance and then you make it it's almost like this pendulum swing of innovation mm. um, and i think we're definitely we're, we're we're potentially heading towards the peak swing in one direction and starting to swing back and i think one of the things that was a giveaway for me was when people started framing problems not in terms of like how much compute was required but the sort of energy and carbon footprint of the compute that was required like when I started seeing people say that they should make models available publicly because you know, that's more environmentally friendly and energy efficient, that, that, that was when it was a clear signal that uh, we, would, we would maybe the pendulum was swinging in the other direction or at least slowing down mm -hmm. in, its, in its outward arc. Fascinating times, though. It's going to be interesting to see what the next few years yield. Um, and, and one of the big things then is, is yeah, like edge, edge devices, which are like, you know, uh, sort of low power, small devices that maybe even work offline you know, in your, your traffic lights and your uh, elevators and, and those kind of things, your microwave, like when you can do high performance inference in your, in your microwave to, to monitor whether your I don't know, hot pocket is, 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 is optimally heated, <laughs> then, then, then that, that's a very different thing to just being able to run some massive GPU cluster to do the same thing. Um, and that definitely approaches biology in, in some very important way. I mean, I think that is a, a tremendously important direction of research is how can we learn 
to learn, but with much less data, much less time, much less computing. Yeah. That's something I'm personally quite interested in. So hopefully... Uh, have, have you seen some of these papers about pruning networks? So you train some like massive multi-million parameter network that can get like 95% accuracy on some difficult task. And then you go and you prune it to like 10% of the size by removing connections and parameters and things. Um, and it still, you know, it drops like at one percentage point in, in accuracy. And yet it's way more efficient. Yeah, I've seen a little bit. It seems that. to me that that's the kind of thing that, that, that we're, that we're going to have to do. It seems to me that that's the kind of thing that the brain is, is able to just sort of do in real time though. Um, and, and it's almost like heuristics strike me as a really quick way. Like caching and heuristics strike me as, as ways in which you might save a lot of time and energy while still doing what seems like really intelligent things. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not a big fan of, of thinking that the brain really does anything akin to what's going on in like the current generation of, of neural nets. I think they're like very different. And in fact, I think they're so different mm. that they're like fundamentally different operations. You know, even if you say, well, you've got yep. neurons that take in some weights or taking an input, weight them, and then activate and fire. There's key operations which I think brains are doing, which are not being implemented mm. in most neural nets, at least, right? And and vice versa. And and vice versa. So I mean, like, it's still unclear if I mean, think about learning, right? I mean, learning in the brain. Well, actually, think about just let's let's do a quick d catalog of the differences between artificial neural nets, as you might see, uh, trained on image nets and doing some inference. Um, and mm. our biological networks. The first one is that biological networks, like the one in your brain, are discrete, right? I mean, their inputs are spikes from other neurons and their outputs are spikes. So whatever the computing you're doing, it has to be encoded as a spike right? compared to an image mm. which can be discrete and differentiable, right? And the differentiability is important for later because the way that we train artificial neural networks is with the backpropagation algorithm, right? The other thing is that because you have spikes, you can encode time in your inputs, whereas mm. the inputs to a neural network, an artificial one, are they tend to be time independent, right? It's just an image, and it's a static image. Exactly. Our eyes, our eyes don't see pixels. Exactly. That that's that's a key thing. And there's other arguments about the, the extent to which our brains are embodied, right? And so when you have an embodied agent, there's this like circular causal interplay between, let's say, you're looking at a visual scene, right? You Get out of the car, it's late at night, and as you look up at the front of your house, you see a shadow, right? And there have actually been experiments on this kind of thing. So that shadow is ambiguous, right? It's a noisy signal. And the first thing that's going to happen is maybe it comes to mind, oh, no, there's a burglar. And you will almost see the form of a burglar, right? Now, it turns out if you track someone's eyes, right, you can build a model of what their eyes should do to minimize the uncertainty that there is a burglar there. So as in like, let's say the competing hypotheses are there's a burglar or the tree that I have, or let's say rather the, the house plant that I have on my porch is swaying in the wind and casting a shadow. Mm. And and it turns out people's eyes move perfectly in such a way as to minimize that uncertainty. Yeah. So this is the whole idea of like salience maps and, and, and those kind of predictive algorithms. Yeah. So I personally, not a fan of, of the salience map model. Um, I think that mm. just like, experimentally to my understanding and i know that we've got more to say on this in future episodes it doesn't hold up perfectly there's just some things which you yeah. expect with a salience map to happen to human vision which don't but leave mm. like, i'll leave that detail aside for now just to say that okay. what seems to be happening right is your eyes are guided by some internal algorithm to move to the parts of your visual scene which will most efficiently discriminate between those two competing hypotheses right and this is this is a is, predictive processing based approach. Mm. And this, as far as I understand, has been quite well experimentally validated. And the point being, though, if you think about what happens when we give a neural network an image, it's, it's getting one image. And so if the network doesn't successfully classify it, there's no way for it to, at least in, in most implementations, to pay attention to certain parts of the image or try and move a couple of degrees one way to get another view, right? Because that mm. is the problem with a lot of training images is they are bad images of the back of the close-up of the head of a duck shunt, and now it must classify that as a duck shunt. but you know what we would do given that same task is just quickly move around and see the front and that's the most uncertainty exactly. minimizing um approach right and so the the biggest difference i want to highlight is like how these networks are trained right so in a neural net again we you have the you have some training data right which is labeled and you get the network to try and predict 
And then you tell it, no, no, you got that one right, you got that one wrong. And you say, okay, calculate the loss between your predictions and your and the actual data or the actual output. And then you do gradient descent, which just means you move in the direction which most quickly makes your loss decrease. It's kind of a, a giant glorified derivative from high school calculus. Yeah. And if you move down that gradient, you minimize the loss. And if your loss is really low, that means you're getting most examples correct. But like so far, the way that the brain learns, and I'm gonna leave a few counter points aside. I mean, some people will claim that the brain is doing gradient descent. And there are some people who claim that the, gra- the, the, the brain has implemented back propagation, but for the most part, learning in the brain happens via sort of what's generally called Hebbian learning, where you have simultaneous firing of, of neurons. And so it's like, if neuron A fires before neuron B and then neuron B fires, you have a simple rule, like increase the strength of the connection because you're saying, well, yeah. A must have affected B and clearly that was the right move. And so yeah. there's huge differences here. And this is leaving aside what we've already spoken about, like these internal computational states. And so this is both a warning to anyone who like gets told like oh no no we're mimicking how the brain works and we're using ai to <laughs> mine new startup that whatever it's a bit overblown first of all and then second yeah. of all like the differences and the amount of research that we still need to do is just huge yeah it's 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 much more similar to the the difference between like the most efficient flying birds and you know your average man-made aircraft so uh, i think yeah but may- maybe even more different i don't know it, it would be it would be it would be difficult to to actually do a comparison there, but yeah, there's some there's some fascinating ideas in, in everything you've said there, um, and 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 that key distinction is almost like the online aspect of it, like you said, where humans will see something, be unsure of what it is, as in that's a you know low confidence classification, and then immediately like move their head, shift their body, you know, cock it to one side to hear better, just just change things to gather different kinds of evidence that can then be used for this rapid automatic hypothesis testing. And the irony is we seem to be better at doing that automatically with our sort of sensory inputs than we are with sitting down and deliberately thinking about integrating evidence from, you know, more conceptual and uh, factual sources, which is which is fascinating, but also makes total sense in an evolutionary sense, right? Like, obviously, we need to be able to do that really effectively to survive. And so it's been heavily selected for, but it's it's kind of a beautiful thing. And to know how exactly that's working would be uh, incredible. Um, and in fact, there's some interesting ways you can you can model this just in a simplified mathematical form. So anyone who's done things to do with uh, classification and looking at sort of, you know, in medicine, you would call it sensitivity and specificity of, of some test. You know, you don't want everything to have you know so many false positives, false negatives, etc. I won't go into it all now, but you can get this ROC curve, receiver operating characteristic. And that's just like straight up, you've got signal and noise and you're trying to classify things as hit or, you know, as true or false. But there's some noise in there and you've got to make trade-offs about like whether you care more about false positives false negatives whatever but then there's this other model which is drift diffusion which actually comes from like modeling particles in physics and what this is is like you're gaining evidence over time so it's it's not a question of just making a decision it's a question of the longer you have to observe and gather more evidence the more sure you can be and then your trade-off is about uh speed versus accuracy and it seems that that's a much nicer model of what humans are doing to integrate evidence um, and, and actually really elegant because it's a super simple model and it, and it is quite informative in, in a number of ways, but obviously limited by its simplicity. Um, and then just you spoke about this, you know, challenge of back propagation in brains. And it's it's interesting. I've seen some recent work on this on people trying to think, you know, are brains implementing some form of back propagation? And, and if so, how? And how is, would this even be possible? And the sort of standard uh, approach to looking at this was that it's biologically implausible to have back propagation in brains. For a number of reasons, the the major one being the way backpropagation works as an algorithm. It's this sort of external view, so it's it's an it's an algorithm that stands outside of the network. For it, for for it to work in the brain, you'd have to have something else observing the brain and doing the backpropagation on it. Right, like the backpropagation algorithm doesn't come from the network itself. It comes from software running outside the data structure of the artificial neural network. Right. Whereas in the brain, the network has to be doing it to itself. Right, so you need some kind of global view to be able to do this um, chain rule to push your sort of updates backward through the network to do the trickle back of the backpropagation. And the brains can't do that. Everything is sort of local and internal as opposed to global and external. So that's the first major issue. Um, the second is that idea we were speaking about earlier about, you know, your eyes don't see pixels, is that everything that happens in biological neural networks is, is spikes of activation. It's not these discrete values. 
Um, and so everything is, is, is time-based and, you know, that's harder to take a derivative of, that's harder to determine sort of thresholds for. It, it, there's, there's way more going on there than just a single value. And then there's also things like, you know, we assume you can just take any of the connections in an artificial neural network and they are, they are perfectly symmetrical. Like the weight one way is the same as the weight the other way, but that's not necessarily true for all neurons or any neurons, right? So there's, there's all of these kind of factors that suggest it's not possible. And then you mentioned Hebbian learning, which just, you know, the way I always think about it is just neurons that fire together, wire together. It's just the, the yeah. easiest uh, little uh, rhyme to remember it. But I mean, the, some of the models that I've seen proposed for how the brain might actually be implementing backpropagation, if it is doing it, it involve sort of like alternating between Hebbian and non-Hebbian learning. But then you need some other kind of signal in the brain that tells it when to switch between that. And because the idea being you don't want to update when you're making a prediction. So you have to constantly know whether you're sort of doing inference or training. Mm. And the brain somehow needs some external thing to synchronize this. Or you need two sets of nodes, one that tells you what state you're in and one that tells you what you're keeping track of. And, and these models are interesting to look at. Some are able to make some predictions and not others. And they all seem flawed in, in many ways. And it's probably none of them or some mishmash jumble together of all of them with some added complexities. And, right, and then this is the crazy thing about how nature works. Nature is incredibly complicated and backwards incompatible. And I mean, it's, it's like it's hack upon hack upon hack. Um, and very difficult to model. And that's what makes it, it fascinating, but it also is what makes this whole idea of, of trading off how how close of an analogy do you want? How how much do you want your planes to be like birds? Um, <laughs> a really fascinating question. Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing that I've got out of this course, and it's just a view that I would say I hold generally, is I think it's quite fashionable for people to say, when we talk about something complicated, right? Take consciousness, take the brain and how it learns and how it works in general. People will often do, I think, what sounds sort of humble and say, no one knows how the brain works or no one knows what consciousness is. And of course, if, if we're being fair to them, if we're being charitable, I think what they're trying to point to is that like a unifying theory in the same way that we have for much of, of let's say, quantum mechanics, much of physics, right, is, is characterized by these big overarching theories, which make very good predictions and are well um, experimentally validated. We don't have that for like several key areas of the brain for consciousness as just two examples here. But I think this, the better habit to get into is to just realize like how far we have come. Because in fact, I think the first time I became conscious of this was actually with physics because people will, people enjoy, I think people enjoy saying things like, well, no one knows what reality is, right? No one knows what's there at the deepest layer. And I think that when you do this sort of play at, at humility you lose the ability to say like just how far we've come and i think people like sean carroll have done a really good job of, of showing like just how much we know about take i mean the standard model of particle physics like not much we're missing right and there's there's key questions which are unanswered but when you then say well, we have no clue you're ignoring this vast amount of research that has so much to say and which if you were the right person you know the the right researcher you could look at all of it and start to piece together and have a more accurate map of, of what we know and then the one what we don't know. And I think the brain is, is similar or at least analogous because when you just go through the literature or have someone talk to you about it or get into a conversation, there are things which it is just surprising that we know this at all. You know, It's surprising mm -hmm. like how much information we have about the actual workings of, of neurons. But sure, you can caveat that all you want and say we're missing key details. But the fact that we have models of of human vision the fact that we've mapped in detail the cortical microcircuit right the the part of our, our our cortex which by many good arguments seems to be associated with our most highest levels of intelligence and and reasoning right we've done all this incredible work and we're now trying to put the pieces together and so i think this is just a, a small rant on on not being overly humble and then by doing so throwing your hands in the air and saying, well, science just doesn't know yet because it's getting there and it's getting there quicker than in any past century. Absolutely. Um, I think Eric Weinstein and Garrett Lisi in their conversation on the Portal podcast, which we both really enjoy, um, summed this up quite nicely with the discussion sort of about how to be like truly great, especially, I mean, they were speaking about in the context of physics, but to be truly great in, in many branches of science, it requires almost this brazen arrogance to think that you can solve a problem and the humility to like accept when you're wrong and 
update from the evidence and it's this this constant sort of dance that you're doing between those two driving forces and and i think it's 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 important to keep those to keep those balanced and not veer too far in in either direction um and and yeah and and critically with everything that we do know about the brain um and and how these sort of information processing systems work both in artificial systems and in biological ones we're able to make predictions and for me that's always the key thing is we this is not uh phlogiston right this is not like we just have words that we substitute in that could be replaced with the term magic um we're actually able to make predictions about the world and then do experiments and verify whether those predictions are true and even with biological brains uh, we we're able to create artificial neural networks that especially with like vision tasks for instance model how we think it's working and then we use those to make predictions and then we go and test it on actual subjects and they have similar outcomes and we go bam that that that's actual information there we've learned something we were able to make predictions and then verify them and i think that is a non trivial thing like that is that is a fundamentally important thing about science and the progress we're making so yes we don't understand everything fully yet but we do know some stuff and we are working very hard to figure out more things um and yeah i, I can't wait to to dig into everything else sort of that you've that you've picked up from from doing this this course how long do you have left still so i've just finished week 1 which was basically okay. uh neuronal dynamics as we said and then week 2 is quite machine learning based and then week 3 kind of brings it all together so yeah i'll have awesome. much more to say about this i'm i'm so excited to dig into it um yeah i th- i think a lot of the biological analogs make such a nice connection with the technical machine learning side and the yeah the computational neuroscience is just really really fucking fascinating man yeah. <laughs> like it just it's so informative for the way we think and for sort of the the martial art of being a good rationalist <laughs> but at the same time just like understanding what it means to be an, an intelligent thing whether you're artificial or biological and how it all fits together just it just in every way that that touches reality Yeah, I'm well, r- reality Don Hoffman's trigger. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's another kettle of fish and so Don Hoffman did a podcast with Sam Harris and it is like three and a half hours long and I think they covered mm. pretty much everything you could possibly want to know from his theory about about the nature of reality or unreality without having to read his book. I would say read it if you want mm. to. and i think they actually extended it i i got the distinct impression yeah. in that conversation that halfman was challenged to defend his thesis on some new ground sometimes and i i love yeah, that cuz uh, this wow. is the one with with anika harris was was on this one as well yes. right and she's recently written a book relating to consciousness and reality and various other properties of the mind um the i just you know what i just i just wonder what it must be like in the in the harris household like that that what what is what is dinner table conversation like with Sam Harris Anika Harris and like their kids at the table i mean that that must that must that must be it, being a fly on the wall in that household must be fascinating or just totally mundane right like humans maybe are are just like that yeah i mean but but definitely a good podcast either way yeah so that we don't have to do that one justice here <laughs> thanks for listening to bits of a tangent If you enjoyed this episode, please get in touch with us and share your thoughts. You can email us at podtangent@gmail.com at or connect with us on Twitter or Instagram through the handle at @podtangent. For more information about us, our backgrounds and other projects we're involved in, visit our website at podtangent.com. There you can also find full show notes which have links to all the great content discussed in the episode. As mentioned in the introduction, We occasionally add bonus content related to the episode or just mention favorite books, organizations and other esoteric internet stuff. If you like the show, please consider rating and reviewing it on iTunes or whatever app you get your podcasts from. This lets them know that we're worth listening to and helps new people discover the ideas we discuss. The best way to hear about future episodes is to subscribe to us in your podcast app and, if you're so inclined, to enable notifications. That way you'll know when we've released something new, which is generally about once a week. Lastly, if you know someone who you suspect might enjoy the kinds of things we talk about here, consider sharing an episode with them. It really is the only way a podcast can grow authentically. We both love having these discussions and relish the opportunity to share ideas with like-minded people around the world. So, your support and listenership are sincerely appreciated.
Until next time.